capability analysis. Uh, I'm Neil Paul Hemus. I direct development of Stack Graphics Centurion. And what I'd like to do this morning is to take about an hour and cover some of the basic concepts of capability analysis and uh, how you can perform a capability analysis using Stack Graphics. Um, turns out that capability analysis is one of the most widely used procedures in Stack Graphics. Uh, so it becomes, uh, I think it's, it's worth some time to talk about what Stack Graphics can do. Now, this is the second in what we hope will be a, a fairly extensive spring uh, series of webinars. We're going to try to do a webinar approximately every three weeks on topics that uh, are requested. Um, you also have a chance during the webinar here to submit questions. Uh, there are too many uh, folks watching at the moment to take them in real time, but if you'll send um, a question, uh, we'll collect those and hopefully have a few minutes at the end of the webinar to cover uh, your, your, your questions. So this is a chance uh, to send them in. Now I'm going to spend a, a couple moments uh, going through some PowerPoint slides here, um, although fairly quickly, uh, I promise, we'll be getting on to uh, uh, the real uh, <coughs> use of stack graphics. But anyway, here's the outline for uh, the next hour. I'm going to start and talk in general about process capability analysis, what, what we mean, uh, what we're trying to do, uh, and so forth. I've then put together a number of different examples of how Stack Graphics can help you to do a capability analysis. We'll start by talking about a capability analysis for attribute data, where basically you inspect an item and simply classify it as a good item or a bad item, pass-fail type data. We'll then talk about uh, what's perhaps more common uh, and that is estimating capability for variable data, where you can actually go out and, and take measurements. We'll talk about the important concept of capability indices. We'll talk about statistical tolerance limits. And then finally, we'll spend a few minutes talking about multivariate capability analysis. Now, multivariate capability analysis uh, is when you take not just a single variable, weight or something like that, but you take multiple variables, maybe weight and height and width and so forth, and estimate the joint capability of those several different variables. And then finally, I'll show you what Stack Graphics can do in terms of sample size determination for these different types of procedures, how we can tell you ahead of time how many samples are necessary to get a good estimate of your process capability. Okay, a uh, quick definition here. When I talk about process capability, what I'm talking about is determining based on a sample of data, data you've collected from your process, of how well that process can meet established specifications. Now, if it's something like uh, the diameter of a part, then the allowable uh, tolerance is typically a target plus and minus something. It's stated in terms of a variable. On the other hand, we can also do a process capability analysis where we don't measure something like the diameter, we simply count something. That's typically called attribute data. For example, the frequency of customer complaints. And I may um, have a requirement that no more than 0.1% of all my customers submits a complaint within the first 30 days of having the product or something like that. So we can have specification both specs, both in terms of measurement variable type data, but also in terms of attribute data. Okay. Now, the essential measurement that we want to get at when we talk about the capability of a process is how often that process is outside of whatever specifications we've established. Okay, now, uh, the two typical measures of, of that are DPM, defined as defects per million. 
you know, where I take a lot of items that I've produced, uh, count how many are defective, um, and as a ratio to a million items, comes up, come up with a number uh, on defects per million. On the other hand, if, uh, if you're involved in, in Six Sigma, uh, you may be more used to something called DPMO, defects per million opportunities, which recognizes the fact that often, uh, for example, a, a customer, if you're looking at customers, there may be more than one way in which that customer uh, might not be satisfied. Uh, they like to talk about defects per million opportunities, where an opportunity basically is a, a case where there's a possibility uh, that the customer might not be satisfied or the item might not be appropriate uh, so that um, items may have more than one opportunity uh, to be out of spec. Okay? We're going to concentrate mostly uh, today on defects per million, which basically looks at an item or a customer and they're either satisfied, it's acceptable, or it's not acceptable. Now, DPM can typically be estimated either directly by simply counting. You know, you go out there and you look at all the customers you have and you count how many were not uh, satisfied. Or it can be inferred from other statistics. Now, common statistics uh, in a capability study are a capability index or a statistical tolerance limit. And if you calculate either one of those, um, a capability index or a tolerance limit, there is a relationship between those statistics and DPM, defects per million. Now, I'll also have to apologize uh, for those of you who may not like the word defect. Okay, I know a lot of people would prefer that we called an item that did not meet the spec a non-conforming item rather than a defective item, but the standard terminology is typically DPM, so that's uh, what I'm going to be using. But if you'd rather think of these items as either conforming to the spec or not conforming, uh, go ahead and, and do that. Okay, now, um, how can we use uh, stat graphics to estimate capability? Well, first off, we can use it to help us count the number of defects. You know, if you go out, you take a sample of 10,000 items, you count how many defective items you've got, we can estimate the defects per million, not only give you a best estimate, but also an upper bound. Unfortunately, direct counting typically, typically requires very large sample sizes. Uh, so if we can avoid just counting things, um, we, we try uh, to avoid it. Um, another way we can estimate DPM if we have measurement data is to take that data, fit a distribution to it, and based upon the fitted distribution, estimate how often we'll be outside of the spec. A third way uh, of uh, determining DPM, as I mentioned before, is to calculate a capability index. A lot of people like to calculate indices such as CPK, uh, and often uh, you'll hear requirements that I would like my CPK to be at least 1.33. Well, that's an indirect statement about the defects per million, because uh, a CPK of 1.33 equates to a DPM, I believe, of about 60. Well, well, we'll find out. We have a Six Sigma calculator that I'll show you in a couple of moments where we can actually go from one, uh, like a capability index to DPM uh, back and forth. Um, another way of demonstrating capability, although it doesn't directly compute DPM, is to calculate a statistical tolerance interval or a, or a statistical tolerance bound and show that that entire interval is within the spec. Uh, and therefore it does guarantee at least a certain uh, maximum uh, uh, DPM. Now, uh, this will all be, uh, I'm sorry, more interesting, uh, more concrete if, if we talk about some real examples. 
Now, uh, the first example I want to talk about is an example in which we're going to do some counting. I'll suppose that we've gone in and we've collected 30 batches uh, and taken a sample of 500 batches, uh, sorry, 500 items from each batch. We've then gone in, inspected all of the items that we've collected and classified them as either being defective or not defective. So for example, if you look at this particular data file, and it's called defects1.sgd, uh, in the first batch I collected 500 items, there were no defective items. In the second batch I took a sample of 500 items, I saw one out of the 500 being defective and so forth on down here for a collection of, of 30 batches, each containing 500 items. Now that's quite a few items, obviously. That's, I think that's 15,000, if I can do my algebra here, 15,000 items uh, that we've actually inspected um, and had to decide whether each was, was good or bad. Now, let's open that uh, data file in Stack Graphics. So I'll switch away from my PowerPoint now and open up uh, a Stack Graphics session that I have running. I'll go now and open up a Stack Graphics data file, and we'll make this data available to you instantly after the webinar uh, if you'd like to play with it. This uh, data file is called Defects 1. Okay, here you can see it. It's the data I showed on that slide a moment ago. I have a total of 30 batches. Each batch contains 500 items. I have counted the number of defective items in each batch, and thankfully you can see I haven't uh, gotten uh, too many defectives. Well, if I wanted to compute defects per million based upon this count data, I would go to the SPC menu item, and incidentally, I'll be using the classic uh, menu uh, in this webinar. There's also an alternative Six Sigma menu, and capability analysis is, is, is under, uh, I think it's under describe, but it might be under measure. Um, anyway, I'm using the classic menu, so it's under SPC capability analysis, and now I'm going to select a capability analysis for attributes. It's, it's attribute data because basically I've looked at each item and decided it was good or it was bad. Now there are two procedures for doing a capability analysis for attribute data. There's uh, one for percent defective and that's designed for data like this, pass or fail, where basically each item is either good or bad. And there's a second one for defects per unit. Defects per unit is used when there may be more than one defect on a particular item, and I want to know on average how many defects there are per item. Again, this is pass-fail data, so I'll just uh, select percent defective. Now, there are two fields that need to be filled in here, two required fields. One is the column that has the number of defective uh, items in it, and that's called defectives in this case and also a column with the sample sizes. I could also put in a target percent defective if I had a target like you know 0.1 percent defective or something like that. I could also put in perhaps an upper spec, the largest uh, percent defective uh, I'd be willing to tolerate. Um, I'm not going to do that though. I'm just going to put in the raw data. Um, and now I'll, I'll see some options for this analysis. Um, if you're doing a percent defective uh, calculation, as I'm going to do, you can choose either a binomial distribution or a hypergeometric distribution. Binomial distribution would be done typically assuming that every batch from which I've taken a sample of 500 items is quite large. Uh, on the other hand, if there were only 10,000 items per batch, and I knew there were 10,000, I might base the analysis on what's called a hypergeometric distribution. In that case, you actually have to put in the population size, um, in this case the batch size, perhaps it would be 10,000 or something like that. But I'm going to do the, the standard sort of approach, and that's just the binomial distribution. Now I can also ask, as I compute the defects per million, for either a two-sided confidence interval on that or perhaps an upper confidence bound. 
I probably don't care how small the number of defects is, so I'm going to ask instead for an upper confidence value. All right, if I do that and press OK, I can then ask for a number of different tables and a number of different graphs. The only thing I'm really interested in here is the analysis summary and the capability plot. So let's just ask for those, and it will pop up for me uh, some summary statistics on the left-hand side, a graph on the right-hand side. Now, the graph on the right-hand side shows me how often I seen amongst my 30 batches no defects, which was most of the time, one defect, which is about 7 out of 30 batches, and uh, two defects. Uh, actually, the points represent the theoretical probabilities from a binomial distribution. The bars represent the observed. Okay. Um, looking at the statistics, though, the interesting quantity uh, is this one right here. It's my estimate of defects per million from this particular data. And I estimate approximately 867 defects per million based upon the 15,000 items that I've, I've looked at. That's my best guess. If you want to know what's likely, what could be possible, we also have up here an upper 95% bound. Okay, I'm 95% certain that my defects per million is no more than about 1,377. So you have a best guess for the defects per million. You also have an upper bound. Underneath that, you can also see the equivalent process Z. Now, Z is a statistic, a capability index that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I'm estimating best guess here for my Z of 3.13. Um, and we'll see what that means uh, uh, when we start talking about variable data. On the other hand, it could be as low as 2.99. Now, there's an inverse relationship between defects per million and Z. The more defects, the lower the Z. So the upper bound on a, on a DPM actually gives you a lower bound uh, on the process Z. But it's around 3, uh, I think a little bit better, 3.13. Okay. Now, it also gives me a tolerance bound at the same time for an average size sample. You see the number 2 here. Okay. What that tells me is that I can expect 95% of all the samples I collect, all samples of 500 items from a batch, to have no more than 2 defective items. So anyway, um, that just tells you basically um, a, a bound on, on how bad a particular sample could be. I noticed I forgot to mute my phone here, so I, I needed to do that. Okay. That's one way uh, of estimating defects per million, where you take a collection of data like this, uh, take a large sample of items, and simply decide whether an observation is defective or not defective. Okay? Now, the problem with that, of course, is it requires a lot of items. It requires, uh, in this case, 15,000 items, or at least that's what, what, what we collected. Now, the second uh, example I want to talk about is measurement data. Okay, much uh, probably more common uh, than simply counting and taking pass-fail data is to collect a set of items from a process and measure something. The file I'm going to talk about in this case is a sample of 100 electronic components. Each of those components um, we've measured the resistivity of the components. Now, it turns out there's an upper spec on resistivity. Resistivity is supposed to be less than uh, or equal to 500. And I'm interested in knowing, based upon the data, 
how many defects per million uh, I have uh, in my particular process. Now, let's open that uh, particular file in Stack Graphics as well. Let's uh, close off this particular file and open the resistivity file. As I said, resistivity has the measured resistivity of 100 electronic components. And you can see they were sampled basically once a day over a particular period of time. To do a process capability analysis on this type of data, I'll go to SPC, Capability Analysis, Variables. Now, we have three procedures in Stack Graphics to do a capability analysis on variable data. The first is for individual's data. That's for data collected one sample at a time, like this data. We can also do a capability analysis for data that comes in groups. Maybe you take five a day, for example. And uh, you'd like to take account of the fact that they come in groups when you do uh, the capability analysis. There's also a multivariate capability analysis procedure that we'll be talking about um, just a little bit later. This data, though, is individual's data. It comes one at a time. Now, when I ask for a capability analysis based on individuals, a dialog box will pop up. It'll ask me where the data is. It'll ask me, optionally, for a column with date, time, or labels. And it'll give me a place to put in a lower spec, a target value, and an upper spec. Well, in this case, I think I hinted that the requirement on resistivity is that it be less than or equal to 500. So I'll fill in the value 500 as the upper spec. Primary interest is knowing how often I'll be outside or beyond 500. All right. When I press OK, the Analysis Options dialog box will come up. Now, you'll see that there's actually a large number of distributions. I think it's 27 different distributions that we can use to model this data. And depending upon what distribution I use, I'll get a different estimate of how often I might be beyond that uh, spec of 500. Now, the typical approach in doing data analysis is to keep things simple if you can. And the simplest model for a distribution, for a, a sample of measurement data, is a normal distribution. Now, we'll want to verify, perhaps, that the normal is appropriate when we do the analysis, but it's sort of our baseline model. So I'll just leave this uh, set to normal. You could also transform the data by taking a log or something like that if you wanted to, but let's just take the defaults, which is to assume resistivity comes from a bell-shaped curve. Now, the next and last dialog box before we see the analysis will ask us what tables and graphs we'd like to see. I'm going to ask for an analysis summary, some capability indices, I'm also going to ask for test for normality so we can see whether a bell-shaped normal curve is appropriate for the data, and a comparison of alternative distributions if in, so that if the normal doesn't uh, work well, it'll suggest something else that does. And finally, I'll ask for the capability plot. Let's press OK. That'll open up an analysis window. You'll see four tables on the left-hand side, a graph on the right-hand side. In when I look at my data, I always typically like to look at a graph. This is what we call the capability plot. You see a histogram of the data. You see superimposed on the histogram the best-fitting normal curve. Now, I think most of you, if you look at that histogram and the normal curve, can see that the histogram uh, isn't particularly symmetric. Uh, in fact, the normal distribution, uh, the curve that I've drawn, has the same mean and standard deviation as the data, but it really isn't fitting the shape very well. Uh, in addition to that, you see a tall vertical line at the specification, that upper spec of 500. You see a shorter vertical line at the mean plus three standard deviations. 
Now, for a process to be capable, that three standard deviation limit uh, has to be pretty comfortably uh, inside uh, of the spec, as it is in this case. So if, in fact, the normal distribution were appropriate, um, the, um, we'd probably be reasonably pleased in this case. You can see there are some other capability indices being calculated on the right-hand side, CPK, PPK, which I'll talk about in just a couple moments. They're at about 1.23, which is okay. Most people are looking for at least 1.33, perhaps 1.5 uh, on those indices. It doesn't quite make that, but um, it's not too bad. Now, at the same time, if I put the graph away and go up to the upper left-hand corner, you see a summary of the data, and in particular, right about here is the estimated defects per million, about 117. In other words, I estimate that 117 items, electronic components out of every million, will have a resistivity beyond 500. Now, that may be good or it may be bad. It depends upon, you know, it's really a business decision. Uh, as far as the statistics are concerned, based upon the normal distribution, okay, and extrapolating that normal distribution out past 500, we would estimate about 117 defects per million. Uh, that's a big if, though, particularly looking at the data and seeing that it doesn't, that normal curve doesn't seem to match the histogram very well. Well, let's go uh, over and look at another table that's generated here. There's a table that Stack Graphics generates whenever you do a capability analysis called test for normality. And the default test is the Shapiro-Wilkes test. Now, the only thing you really know, need to know about the Shapiro-Wilkes test is to look at the p-value. If the p-value is less than 5%, less than 0 0.05, then the normal distribution does not fit the data well. You can see in this case, in fact, the Shapiro-Wilkes is well below 5%. Well, it, it's tiny, uh, giving us a very strong rejection of the idea that the normal distribution is appropriate. And if the normal distribution is not appropriate, then that 116 is garbage. doesn't really mean anything. It's an extrapolation of a model that doesn't fit the data. All right, well, what do we do? Well, uh, one thing we can do is we can ask Stack Graphics down in the bottom left, all right, suppose the normal distribution doesn't fit, what distribution might fit? And it will give you a table here of other distributions. Sort them according to one of various uh, goodness of fit statistics. In this case, it's used the log likelihood function to rank the distributions from best to worst. And in fact, it suggests the one at the top here that the largest extreme value distribution um, would be a considerably better distribution. In second place, the log normal, then we have a log logistic and a number of others. And you can see the normal's quite far down on the list. Well, at that point, it does suggest the largest extreme value might be better. I can go back to my graph, push my right mouse button, select analysis options, and now change from the normal distribution to the largest extreme value distribution. If I do that, you'll see the distribution switch. And now you see the best fitting largest extreme value distribution, which is this distribution with a longer tail to the right hand side than the left hand side. Uh, you can see, unfortunately, uh, it does reduce the capability indices quite a bit from they were about what, 1.2, something like that, down to about 0 0.85, 0.88. Um, it also has a fairly big impact on defects per million. I'm now estimating uh, something over 4,000 items per million uh, out beyond that spec. Um, I sort of like the normal distribution better, at least the answer I got from the normal distribution, but if the normal distribution is the wrong model, you've got to use something else, and in this case, the largest extreme value distribution uh, is considerably better. 
Okay. Now, that's a direct estimation of defects per million by simply taking the fitted distribution and looking at the area under the tail in the tail of that distribution outside the specification limit. Um, I know that uh, you know some of you like to do it that way. Uh, others of you would prefer to calculate things called capability indices. Now, capability indices, and there are a number of them, try to summarize for us how we're doing with respect to a specification. I've listed three very popular capability indices here, one called CP which is referred to as the two-sided capability index, where you take the upper spec limit minus the lower spec limit and divide by six times your estimate of the process signal. Okay, now you can only do that, of course, if you have both an upper spec and a lower spec. So we would not be able to compute that particular statistic uh, on this particular data. Um, a probably more popular statistic is CPK. In CPK, what you do is you start with your mean, your process mean, your estimate at least, mu hat. Find the distance to the closer specification if you have two, or if you only have one like we do, only an upper spec, then you simply take the upper spec minus the estimated mean and divide by three times the estimated signal. Okay. Now, there are a lot of rules of thumb uh, out there for what CP and CPK should be. I think I mentioned before that people are typically looking for a CPK of maybe 1.33 or 1.5, something like that. Um, I'll show you in a moment what that would mean in terms of defects per million. Uh, there's a third index that uh, folks like to compute called Z, very similar to CPK except the denominator is one sigma instead of three sigma. So in fact, uh, Z is a third uh, of CPK. Now going back to stack graphics, uh, these indices are computed and displayed over in this pane here. And you can see uh, right now it's computed the CPK and the equivalent DPM. Uh, stack Graphics will actually give you two capability indices. It'll give you what's called a short-term capability index. That would be CPK. And also a long-term performance index, which some folks like to call PPK. The only difference is what standard deviation they use for the denominator. In the case of long-term performance, we use the standard deviation, just an ordinary sample standard deviation of all the data. Whereas in the case of a short-term sigma, we try to get the standard deviation from observations close together. And you can see a note that in this case, the short-term sigma is estimated from the average moving range. Now, if the process is in a state of statistical control, as it is in this case, then you'll typically see very similar results uh, for short-term and long-term. You know, what you're capable of doing in the short term, you're also capable of doing in the long term if you're, un, if you're in control. On the other hand, if the process is not in a state of statistical control, if the mean's moving around, then short-term capability may turn out to be much better than long-term performance. So stack graphics will give you uh, both of those standard estimates. You can see it also gives you underneath the corresponding defects per million. Now, um, I think I mentioned at least once, maybe more than once, that there is a correspondence between something like a CPK or a Z-score and the defects per million. To bring that home, we've added under our tools menu something called a Six Sigma calculator. Now, the Six Sigma calculator allows you to put in a particular value of either Z or DPM or percent defectives or percent yield or CPK or sigma level or whatever, and it will compute the other measures for you. You also need to indicate in the six uh, sigma calculator whether you have a two-sided spec or just a lower limit or just an upper limit. 
Now in our case, we have just an upper limit, so I'll click upper limit only. Where it says CPK, I'm going to type in 0 0.83, which is our estimate of, uh, in this case, uh, oh, sorry, 8, I wrote in my notes 8.3, it was actually 8.5.3, I guess, uh, which is my estimate of short-term capability. If I then press OK, it'll open up a window. And I'm particularly interested in the table on the left-hand side, which tells me that if I have a CPK of 0.853, that's equivalent to a defect per million number of 5,248. Uh, the equivalent z-score is also is 2.6. And for those of you uh, who are into Six Sigma, this process is at approximately a what would be called a four sigma level. It's a four sigma process. To get up to a six sigma process, to be a six sigma process, you have to get those defects down to about 3.4 defects per million. With 5,000 defects per million, you're not at six sigma, you're not even at five sigma, you're what we would call a, about a four sigma process. So the Six Sigma calculator lets you take any one statistic and uh, calculate uh, from other things. Okay. Well, uh, enough for that particular data. I need, I need to move along here. Uh, so let me bring up another data set. I have a third data set that I brought along. This one's called Bottles. Bottles uh, is similar to resistivity in that periodically I've gone out and taken a sample from my process. In this case, what I've done is about every 10 minutes, I've gone into my process, taken a bottle, a glass bottle. Um, and for each bottle that I collect, I measure its strength, its, its bursting strength. Okay? We have a specification on strength. The strength of the bottles is supposed to be between 200 and 300 PSI. Okay. Now, I'm going to use this data to demonstrate another way of getting a process capability, and that is by calculating what are called statistical tolerance limits. Statistical tolerance limits give me a bound on a certain percentage of my population. If you do statistical tolerance limits, you probably do things like 95, 99 bounds. You ask for a 95% confidence interval on 99% of your population. Well, the statistical tolerance limits in stack graphics are under describe numeric data statistical tolerance limits. Now, there are two procedures in stack graphics for computing statistical tolerance limits. You can do it directly from the data. You give it a column of data like I have, and it will compute uh, the tolerance limits. On the other hand, if you assume the data come from a normal distribution, big assumption, but if you do, you can simply put in the mean the stan and the standard deviation, and that's all you need to compute the limits. Since I have the raw data, I'm going to tell it, uh, to give me tolerance limits from my observations. Now, it'll bring up a uh, dialog box. It'll want to know where is my data. It's in a column called strength. Um, and I can put in an indication of the time at which it was uh, collected. That's just used for, for doing various plots. It also allows me, if I want to put in the spec, this data actually has a lower spec limit of 200, uh, a nominal value of 250, that's the target value, and an upper spec of 300. Okay. So I've put in the data, I've put in the spec. It now asks me, what distribution do you want to use to compute the tolerance limits? And it allows me to compute them based upon a normal distribution, a log normal distribution, a liable distribution. Uh, it'll let me assume a normal distribution after some transformation. 
you know, if I've done maybe a box Cox transformation or, or I want to take the logs or something like that, I can do it based on those. Um, and then there are a couple non-parametric approaches where you actually don't have to assume any particular distribution. You can also request either a two-sided tolerance interval or one-sided tolerance bounds. Okay, in this case, the spec is two-sided. 200 to 300 is my allowable range, so it makes sense to do two-sided tolerance limits. Okay. Um, asking uh, for the analysis, let's ask for an analysis summary and a tolerance plot. We'll just take the defaults and press OK. And a particular interest here will be the uh, fitted distribution. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing, an important one. <laughs> Let me right click, go back to analysis options. In addition to the type of limits, I also specify a confidence level and a population proportion. The default is to estimate a tolerance interval in which I can be 95% confident contains at least 99% of the data. Now, I could ask for a, a tougher interval. I could ask for 95% confidence on 99.9 .9 or 90 or something like that. Standard tolerance intervals, most common are 95-99, which is why that's the default, 95% confidence on 99% of the population. But you can ask for anything you want, depending upon the, how critical it is to be within the spec. Okay. Now, the main output of the analysis here is this particular graph. This graph shows you a histogram of the data. And you can see this data is much more uh, symmetric than the resistivity data was. It shows the normal distribution with the same mean and standard deviation as the data. It shows the spec. The spec goes from 200 to 300 with a target of 250. And then it shows, in this case, with the, small, uh, the shorter vertical lines, the calculated tolerance limits. Okay, the tolerance limits range here from 223 to 286. And the way to interpret this is that I am 95% confident that all the bottles I'm producing have strength somewhere between 223 and 286. Okay. So I know that at least 99%, in this case quite a bit more, but at least 99% of the product are within the spec. Now that's not just a point estimate, that's an, that's an estimate, that's a statement with 95% confidence. Okay, so it's better than just a, a single DPM in that it makes a statement about which you can be, in this case, 95% confident. Okay, well that's a, another way of approaching process capability and has become very, very common in recent years. Uh, these tolerance intervals uh, putting a bound on a given percentage of a population. Now, for every one of those three data sets I've shown you, uh, there was only a single variable. It's also possible to do a multivariate capability analysis. Now, incidentally, you can download my presentation from the, our website uh, after I'm done. Um, I've tried to put in slides to summarize uh, a lot of what I've done. Uh, the last example, though, uh, that I want to talk about here, the last data set we'll look at, has to do with multivariate capability analysis. I think I mentioned that typically, if I look at an item that I've produced, there's more than one variable of interest. You know, I may be interested in the strength of the bottles, I also might be interested in their height or their weight. Now, typically, uh, if you had multiple variables, you do a separate capability analysis on each one of the variables. And if the variables are not correlated with each other, it's 
you know, not bad uh, to do that. On the other hand, there are cases where the variables you measure are strongly correlated. So that if you're out of spec on one variable, you're likely to be out of spec on another at the same time. And if you simply you know, add up the, per, the defects per million on one variable with the defects per million on another with the defects per million on a third, you may overestimate the overall defects per million. You know, if you add up the number of times they're out on separate variables. So in stack graphics, what we've done is we've added in a procedure to estimate the joint probability of being in spec, okay, taking account of the correlation amongst the variables. Now, the data set we're going to look at, the fourth data set, is in a file called bivariate.sgd. What I've done in this particular file is I've taken a sample of 150 items. Okay. On each item, I've measured its height and its weight. The spec on height is 5 plus or minus 0.3. The spec on weight is 215 plus or minus 7. So I've added, in addition to height and weight, three columns in the file. One with the lower spec limit on the two variables, uh, another with the nominal or target values, and a third uh, with the upper spec. Now, to do a multivariate capability analysis, the first thing I need is to load that data, obviously. So let me go out and find the bivariate data set. There it is. There are 150 rows in this file. I've got the measured height, the measured width, and the specifications. To do the multivariate capability analysis, I'll go to SPC, Capability Analysis, Variables and you'll see a special procedure for multivariate capability. Now, this will bring up the dialog box that you see here. It'll want to know what columns have the data. In this case, it's height and weight. What column has the upper specs? What column has the target values? And what column has the lower specs? When I press OK, It'll offer me a number of tables and graphs. I think I'll pick an analysis summary, capability indices, capability plot, and capability ellipse. Now, this is a particular procedure in stack graphics that takes a while to do the calculations. It can take 30 seconds to calculate uh, the multivariate capability. Problem is, incidentally, what it's based upon a multivariate capability analysis is what's called a multivariate normal distribution. Okay, now it's done, but it, it does take a few moments to do it. Estimating the probability of being beyond the spec with a multivariate normal distribution is an iterative process that can take uh, take some some time to calculate. Anyway, uh, here is uh, the equivalent of our capability plot. Uh, what you're looking at here is actually called a bivariate normal distribution. A bivariate normal distribution has a normal distribution for each of two variables. You can see there's a normal distribution along the weight axis. There's a normal distribution along the height axis. Um, it's a hill, and the diagonal here is proportional to the correlation between the variables. In this case, height and weight are positively correlated. If height is low, weight tends to be low. If height is high, weight tends to be high. So there's a definite correlation amongst the variables. I've colored in blue the multivariate normal distribution density wherever it's within the specs and I've colored it in red wherever it's outside of the spec. So you can see that we're actually doing fairly well, except perhaps in the corners. I don't know if you can see, for example, in the back right corner, there is a little bit of that hill in the red zone, which is outside the spec. 
Now, to estimate how often I'm outside the spec, I need to integrate that multivariate normal distribution and find its area in the red zone. And you can see the program's done that and is telling you, in this case, it's estimating a defects per million of a little more than 5,000, about 5,015. That is the chance, the probability that one or the other or both variables will be out of spec. Now, if I come back to this particular summary here, back in the upper left, this is a table of particular interest. It will tell me that the estimated defects per million based upon height is about 4,374. Based on weight, it's about 948, 49. The joint defects per million is about 5,015. Now, notice that the joint defects per million is not the sum of the other two. The sum of the other two would be, what, about uh, 40, 50, 450, something like that. And it's only 50, 15. That's because of the strong positive correlation between the variables. If you're out on one variable, there's a good chance you'll also be out on, the, on another. So the joint defects per million is somewhat less than the sum of the individual defects per million. Okay. Uh, another graph that's of interest here, uh, I call it the capability ellipse. This only works if you have two variables. The process works if you have three, four, five, and so forth. Uh, the graphs uh, are harder to, obviously, to, to draw, though, with more than two. Anyway, this is what's called a capability ellipse. This ellipse here shows you in the space of height and weight where I expect 99.73% of all my samples to fall. 99.73% is the equivalent of plus and minus three sigma. Okay? Um, the rectangular area is the area when both variables are in spec. And you can see with respect to that capability ellipse that I'm getting points out of spec down here and up here, um, not matching the spec on height actually, I guess, as well as the spec on weight. So the white area uh, of the ellipse is uh, the equivalent uh, of being within three standard deviations in a multivariate sense. Now, you can also see back on the last uh, table that I asked for here, a table of, of capability indices. There are equivalent capability indices that one can compute in the multivariate sense. There's a multivariate CP, there's a z-score, there's a sigma quality level. And in stack graphics, we compute them basically from the DPM. We first compute the defects per million. In this case, it's about 5,015. And then we figure out what the typical capability index would be, you know, using our Six Sigma calculator for a defects per million of 5,015. That would equate to a CP or a CPK of 0.86. Uh, equate to a z-score of about 2.57, and again, a sigma quality level of just a little bit uh, better than four sigma. So it seems like I have another four sigma process here. Okay. Well, that's a, an interesting procedure, uh, unique to stack graphics, I believe, but very important when, in fact, you do have variables uh, that are um, correlated, that are strongly correlated. Now, the last thing I want to show you here, uh, before I take some questions, uh, is what we can do in stack graphics to help you with the sample size problem. Okay. One of the big questions that statisticians get asked a lot is how much data do I need? How much data should I be collecting in order to estimate the defects per million or to estimate the capability indices, 
or to estimate the statistical tolerance limits. Well, under our tools menu in Stack Graphics, there is a section on sample size determination. And I will show you how to figure out a good sample size for each of those different approaches. First off, let's suppose I was just counting. Let's suppose I was just going to take a sample of items, inspect each item, and give it a pass-fail grade. Okay? How many samples would I need to look at? Well, that's basically the, what we call the one sample problem. So I'm going to go to sample size determination, one sample. Now, the first thing it's going to ask me is, what do I want to estimate? Do I want to estimate a mean, a sigma, a proportion, or a rate? Well, in this case, it's a binomial proportion. I want to estimate the proportion of the items that will be out of spec, uh, that will fail. Okay. Down here, it will ask me for a hypothesized proportion. What do you think the proportion is? About what? Is it 0.5, 50%? Is it 0.01, 1%, what, what is it? Now, it turns out the amount of samples you need depends upon what the proportion is. If you want, want to estimate a, uh, a proportion that's large, like around 0.5, you don't need as many items as if you're trying to estimate a very small proportion. Well, I thought I would ask, how many samples would I need? to estimate a proportion that's around 0 0.001. That's basically one out of a thousand failures. Okay, you can put in anything you want. I decided to put in one out of a thousand. Okay. How do you want to estimate it? Well, you have a number of different choices for sample size, size problems. I usually like relative error. If I specify relative error, Okay, I can tell it, hey, I want to estimate the proportion of defective items to within plus or minus 10%, whatever it is. I don't want to be off by more than 10% of whatever the true value is with 95% confidence. Okay. Well, I might put that in, press OK, and it will tell me, okay, if you think the proportion is around 0.001, you want to estimate the proportion within plus or minus 10% with 95% confidence, you need 422,065 items. Hmm, that's a lot of items. At that moment, I might change my mind, press the right mouse button, go to analysis options. Well, how about not within 10%, how about within plus or minus 50%? with 95% confidence. You press OK. And now it says, well, in that case, if, you want to be, if you're willing to be off by plus or minus 50%, you only need around 23,000 items. Okay. This is why we typically don't estimate defects per million by counting. If we can avoid it, if we can take measurements instead, we can typically get away with much smaller samples than simply a pass-fail test. Now, the second approach I talked about was capability indices. So let's go to tools again. And in this case, let's go to sample size determination and tell it that what we're interested in doing, we've got measurement data, is estimating a capability index. Okay. Now, the sample size procedure will give you the needed sample size to estimate either CPK, CP, or CPM. If, you, if you're not familiar with CPM, it's a modification to the standard CP statistic to try to incorporate how far you are from the mean. CPK is the most common, that's the default. I need to specify in this case what I think about what I think CPK will be. I'll say, hey, I think it'll be around 1.33, and then tell it the relative error that I'm satisfied with. So I'm going to actually take the default. The default says I want to estimate CPK to within 10%, plus or minus 10%, 
uh, when, I, when it's around 1.33. If you press OK, it'll say, OK, the required sample size will be 154. And if you read the stat advisor here, it says to be 95% confident that the value of CPK is no less than 10% below the estimated value, the required size is 154 if the estimate equals 1.33. Okay? Um, so to be no more than 10% uh, off from the true CPK, if it really is 1.33, I need a sample of 154. Now, 10% is a lot in CPK. That means that if it's 1.33, I may only be getting a 1.20. That's 10% below. And that's with 154 observations. I could be that far off with 154 observations. Good luck to those of you who try to estimate capability with 30 observations. Uh, capability index is a tough thing to estimate. Errors are 10% at 154. If you want less than that, you need more than that uh, in terms of sample size. And then finally, I can also ask the program what size samples I would need to estimate a statistical tolerance limit. Okay, going to the tools menu, again, you'll see I can choose the normal distribution, the log normal distribution, the Weibull distribution, or the non-parametric distribution. Um, going back to the bottles example, um, I had decided to base my tolerance limits there on a normal distribution because it was a fairly symmetric set of data. Uh, to determine statistical tolerance limits, you first pick your distribution. Secondly, you specify the mean and the standard deviation of your process. Now, I happen to know, I happen to remember, uh, oops, I remembered wrong. Uh, if I remember it correctly, uh, a good bottle making process should have a mean of about 250 and a standard deviation of about 11. Down here, I'll tell it I'm going to do two-sided tolerance limits. 95% limits for 99% of the population. The lower spec limit on bottles was 200 on strength. The upper spec was 300. And then finally, there's a field over here called allowance. Allowance lets me specify how large I want the, my tolerance interval to be relative to the spec. By setting it to 80%, I'll be telling it that I want to estimate a 95-99 tolerance interval that's no larger than 80% of the distance between the specs. Okay. Because I know that there'll be some error typically when I take a sample uh, in both the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, I'd like my tolerance uh, interval not to cover the entire range of the spec, but some fraction. Well, if I specify 80, it'll tell me the required sample size for what I asked is 20. If I take a sample of 20 observations, and the data come from a normal distribution with a mean of 250 and a standard deviation of 11, I can expect my 95-99% tolerance interval to take to go from about 210 to 290, which is 80% of the distance between the specs, which were 200 and 300. Now, 20 is a lot less than the, than the 154 for the capability indices, but I'm only asking to bound 99% percent of the observations. You know, in tolerance and a capability index, you're typically uh, talking more like 99.99% of the observations. So it requires a, a, a larger sample. But if it's a 95-99 tolerance interval you're interested in, which is very common, you need only 20 observations uh, to get this particular tolerance. Uh, 
Okay. Well, uh, that does it for the information I wanted to cover. I hope that gave you a, a pretty good idea of what Stack Graphics does with respect to process capability analysis. Now, obviously, an hour is not enough uh, to explain everything in detail. It's obviously more of a, more of a survey, but I'm uh, hoping I have pointed out some interesting things uh, for you all to follow up on. More information, you can go to our website or please send us an email, info at stackgraphics.com. Uh, mention that you listen to the webinar. If you have a particular question, we'll be happy to respond. All right, now I'm going to go and take a look at any questions that have been submitted. Um, there appear to be uh, right now only two questions that have been sent in. So if you have more, now's the time to send them in. But let, let me talk, let me ask, see what two questions came in. Um, the first question was, what do the blue box and the red line mean? I missed that. Uh, blue box and red line. Um, I'm not exactly sure what example that actually refers to. Um, if that's your question, uh, give me a little bit more uh, information. I'm not real sure where that was was uh, meant. Oh, plot for example number one on defects. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, that's back here. Let me back up. I've, as I said, I've got these in the PowerPoint slides. I think this must be the one. This was my first example. Uh, over here is the graph, which I uh, believe uh, we're referring to now. Um, what I've done in this particular graph is I've taken the data. There were uh, 30 samples, um, and we counted the number of defects. The bars show a histogram. How often did we observe zero defects? How often did we observe one defect? How often did I observe two defects? The squares represent the fit of a binomial distribution to that particular data. You know, it's like the fitted normal curve, except the, in this case a binomial distribution is appropriate for discrete data, where there's only zero defects or one defect or two defects. The red line, oh, I didn't actually mention what the red line was. Uh, it's the upper tolerance limit. Uh, over here on the calculation, uh, it says that I estimate 95% of all samples I take will have no more than two defective items, samples of 500. Okay, so it is a tolerance limit, an upper upper tolerance limit on the number of defectives I would expect to see in a sample of 500. 95% of the time I'll see two or less defectives when I take a sample of 500. You're right, I did not mention that. Thank you. Uh, secondly, second question. Is there a way to display multiple sets of sigma limits in the capability plot? Um, okay, let me bring up that capability plot again. Um, and I believe I did that capability plot uh, on, uh, I think I did it on resistivity. Let's go ahead and do it on bottles. Um, let's do an, a capability analysis, variables data on individuals, put in the strength of the bottles, put in lower spec of 200, upper spec of 250, I'm sorry, nominal of 250, upper spec of 300. If I push OK, I'll just take all the defaults, uh, I'll get myself a capability plot based upon uh, a normal distribution. 
Now, as I mentioned before, what this does is it shows you the normal distribution with plus and minus three sigma limits. I think the question was, can I put other sigma limits on there at the same time? The answer to that is not directly. However, there is something in stack graphics called the, um, what's it called? The uh, stack gallery. Oh, I forgot for a moment. <laughs> Where I can actually take one plot and overlay it with a second. Okay. So, for example, let, be, let me go ahead and just label this point right now as being the three sigma point. All right? So I created a little label. I'm going to put it down uh, next. Oops, didn't grab the right label. I'm going to put it down next to one of these points. Hmm. I'm grabbing the wrong uh, label here. That's better. Now I got, now I got it moved. Um, let's uh, take this graph, right click, and tell it I like to copy the pane, this pane, this graph, to the stack gallery. Now the stack gallery is a place where we can hang graphs, either side by side or put them on top of each other. And if I go into the upper right, press the right mouse button and say paste, and then perhaps double click, you'll see that it's taken that graph and pasted it in to the stat gallery. Okay? Now, now I'm going to go back to this original graph. Right click, go to analysis options, and down here where it says six sigma limits, I think I'll change it to eight sigma limits. Okay. And you can see that what that did was to move uh, the limits out. If I now say right mouse, copy pane to stat gallery, go back to the stat gallery, right click, say paste, it'll ask whether I want to replace or overlay the second graph on the first. If I say overlay, okay, it's now put the four sigma limits on the original graph. Now, it cop doesn't copy text from the second graph, it copies, though, uh, everything inside the axes other than text. And I can also, I believe, I haven't done this in a long time, but if I right-click and say Add Item, I believe I could add some more text to this graph for Sigma. And then they overlaid each other, but there you go. Uh, you can play with that a little bit uh, until you can see the three sigma uh, and the four sigma limits. So you can't put multiple sigma limits on directly inside a process capability, but if you use the stat gallery, you can create your three sigma limits, copy it to the gallery, change it to four sigma limits, and the way I did that, remember, I right-clicked, went to analysis options, and where it said eight sigma, that's the distance between the two limits, change it from six to eight, you can then create the four sigma limits, overlay it on top of the first. That stack gallery is it, and that overlay feature allows you to create things that we may not have thought of initially. All right, any more questions come in? I'm looking at my chat box. I don't see any more questions. In that case, I, I'm going to wrap it up then. Um, again, I hope this gives you a good idea about what stack graphics can do with respect to process capability. Um, give us an hour or two. We'll, we've recorded this webinar. We'll put it up together with the sample data files and also my PowerPoint presentation on our website.
actually go to the home page, click on webinars, and uh, I hope by mid-afternoon at least we'll be able to uh, get that recording up there if you want to hear me say all this again. Anyway, thanks for, uh, for listening. I'm going to try to do another webinar, hopefully in about three weeks' time. Uh, the next topic is going to be design of experiments. Thank you.